What would you do if you were Superman? How would you guarantee food security for all? For decades, critics of the zero-sum mentality and scarcity model of neoliberalism and economics have argued that, in stark contrast with that neo-Malthusian idea that we will run out of food, these critics maintain that we actually suffer from an overproduction of the wrong foods and a maldistribution of the right foods. We are suffering in developed countries and underdeveloped countries alike from malnutrition. In rich regions, we are overfed but undernourished. In poor countries, we're underfed but undernourished. What binds us together is that we are not feeding our bodies, rich or poor, with the proper nutrition. Of course, the wealthy have a possibility for a wealth of possibilities, so they don't have to suffer from malnutrition. But many of us suffer nonetheless, mostly because we focus our economy on addictive substances to increase our profit margins. Diabetes, obesity, often combined today into the term and disorder diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, many cancers, even dementia, are called lifestyle diseases and are now being attributed to a particular peculiar kind of malnutrition, sometimes referred to as overnutrition, although I would debate that any nutrients are really involved. Mostly what we are talking about is a surfeit of empty calories from starches and sugars that raise the blood sugar level and stimulate radical insulin response, visceral fat accumulation, inflammation, and other stress disorders. For the other half of the world, malnutrition, I would argue, also involves an oversupply of starches and sugars. That is, the poor are also addicted to wheat, rice, corn, sugar, potatoes, and the products made from them. Products whose market price is perversely supported by subsidies that create severe market distortions. We've all heard, even here in the U.S., about food deserts, places in our inner city communities where the poor live on the McDonald's dollar menu, and cheap bags of chips and other junk food, all because healthy, nutritious food is too expensive and bad eating is cheap. If you want a first-hand witness to the food desert phenomenon, and a real solution to it, check out the work of my heroic friend Ron Finley, the self-described ghetto gardener in South Los Angeles. He champions a movement to turn food deserts into cornucopias, but he's facing an uphill battle. All over the world, no matter where I go, I see the same eating habits. The global industrial agriculture machine is powerful and extends its distribution networks to every corner of the planet. As documented by the Jimmy Cagney movie, One, Two, Three, even back in the 1950s, made during the Cold War, Coca-Cola, for example, was making backdoor deals to get their caffeine-saturated sugared soft drink into Eastern Germany and into Communist Russia. We may have political and ideological differences, but everybody is addicted to the same drugs, resulting from the production of four grasses and one tuber, wheat, rice, corn, sugar, and potatoes. And almost everybody, even ISIS and Al-Qaeda, think things go better with Coke. As a Coca-Cola executive proudly exclaimed to me at the annual Coke conference in Puerto Vallarta when I was fresh out of college in 1987, we now have a Coke machine on top of Machu Picchu. We'd like to hire you to go around the world and get Coke products to the remotest places, if you're interested. You spent a year in the jungles of Borneo and you speak Indonesian, I could see you bringing coke to the deep jungle tribes. Yeah, good money, but I declined the generous offer to be a well-paid adventure explorer Coca-Cola drug dealer. So the critics of the Malthusian paradigm were both right and wrong. Food distribution is both the problem and the solution. Inadequate food distribution, when it comes to real food, is literally starving people. But increased food distribution when it comes to grains and junk food is also starving people. This is because non-nutritional cash crops aren't just empty calories providing zero nutrition. They're actually anti-nutrients. They rob the body of nutrients. The more you eat of them, the more you increase the risk of starvation. In his book, Sugar Blues, as I recall it from my undergraduate days studying biological anthropology at Harvard, William Dufty describes a case where a ship carrying sugar back to England wrecked on a deserted island near Barbados with nothing to eat. While waiting for rescue, the Europeans on the ship refused their slaves any of the sugar. When rescue eventually came many weeks later, the slaves were the only survivors, emaciated and weak, 
that they lived while their sugar-gorging masters wasted away from nutritional disorders. Dufty points out that living on sugar is sort of like running an engine without oil, only worse. Plenty of energy, but no enzymes or catalysts or lubricants. Without vitamins and minerals to regulate and smooth its operation, the engine seizes. The last thing you want to do is run an engine dry. Another anecdote is told of American pioneers who were snowed in with their dogs one brutal winter for months, but had a supply of potatoes in the cellar to help them get through the winter. When the thaw came and they were dug out, all the people were dead, but the dogs were alive. The reason given? The people had eaten the potato starch, but had thrown the potato skins to the dogs. Current research on caloric restriction actually shows us that a diet that is dense in proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals, but completely deficient in empty calories, actually helps you live longer. Scientists like UCLA's Roy Walford, who was part of the team of eight pioneers who lived inside the Biosphere 2 experiment in the deserts of Arizona, where a simulation of what it might be like living on Mars was carried out in the early 1990s, have shown since the 1960s that at least in rodents, cutting caloric intake by about 50% can lead to a doubling of lifespan. Walford extended the research to human beings and the results showed dramatic improvements in blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol, particularly, quote, when the diet was started at a young age. The abstract of a classic scientific paper from 2005 called Dietary Restriction in the Nematode Senorhabditis Elegans showed that the benefits of caloric restriction may be fairly universal across phylogeny. Quote, the first observation of the positive effect of reduced food intake on mammalian lifespan was made 70 years ago, they say. In the decades that followed, researchers successfully applied this method to increase the lifespan of a very wide range of animals. The nematode, Senorhabditis elegans, is an excellent model organism for studying the aging process. However, relatively little effort has been made to study the effects of dietary restriction in C. elegans. In this review, the paper says, we discuss the difficulties of subjecting C. elegans to dietary restriction, the effects of dietary restriction on metabolism and stress defense, and the potential role of different signaling pathways in dietary restriction-induced life extension. Recent experiments suggest that the TOR, or target of rapamycin pathway, rather than insulin-like signaling, might be involved in mediating the life-extending effect of dietary restriction." End quote. In my own family, whether it's been due to insulin-like signaling or some other pathway, the effects of dramatically reducing carbohydrate intake have been life-saving. My father went into a diabetic coma a few years ago an example of a disrupted insulin system, and on top of that had advanced dementia. The hospital stay was doing him more harm than good, and the doctor admitted to me that the diet in the hospital, called a diabetic diet for some crazy reason, was actually killing him. The so-called diabetic diet was actually a low-fat and relatively high-sugar diet. It just contained less sugar than the standard awful hospital diet. It even had low-fat ice cream and fruit juice in it. And they called that a diabetic diet. Sure, it will make you into a diabetic. The doctor lamented that hospitals are a business and that they have contracts with certain food vendors, all of whom provide sugar and starch rather than nutrition. She wouldn't speculate whether or not that was intentional, that is, to keep patients sick so they have to stay in the hospital paying more, but she did say it was frustrating to her that she had no power to do anything about it. Her advice was to bring our own food in if we could visit enough. Eventually, we got my father out of the hospital and into a nursing home, but the food there was no better. Fortunately, the Indian doctor in residence was sympathetic to our plight. He agreed that caloric-rich diets were the leading factor for illnesses in America and actually around the world, contributing in a big way to inflammation that exacerbates other illnesses. He said, he would try to see that my father didn't get the bad food the nursing home provided if we would bring in our own for him, but he said the best thing that we could do would be to get dad out of the nursing home. With his permission, we brought my father home, and he and I and my mother all got on the paleo lifestyle diet, which involves eliminating all wheat, corn, rice, sugar, potatoes, and fruit juice and milk. It has other restrictions, but calorie restriction 
through carbohydrate reduction and elimination of grains is the main benefit of the diet. The effects were dramatic. All three of us lost between 20 and 30 pounds without exercising, and eventually my father's adult onset diabetes, which he had had for several decades, was cured, by which I mean we were able to take him off of all his medications for diabetes and cholesterol. His dementia also improved to an interesting extent. When he went into the hospital, he couldn't recognize family members and would call us by the wrong name. And three years later, when he finally died from heart and kidney complications, he at least knew all of his family members, not only by sight, but when talking on the phone. A cardiologist that I lived with, who was observing my dietary changes, and his wife, who was a nurse, said, we don't have enough data on this because it's difficult to get a study funded for this sort of thing. But the anecdotes are powerful. And indeed they are. Many of my students at Mercy College in the environmental sustainability and justice classes I taught there during the years I was there, took the challenge to spend a semester on paleo and document the effects. All reported healthy weight loss, more energy, elimination of cravings, better mood and less fatigue, particularly a disappearance of the usual afternoon slump that makes classes after lunch so difficult to get through. Myself, I did a body fat index and treadmill test in the sports science department and got results for somebody 20 years under my age. Sure, it's anecdotal for now, but empirical research can be done and you can do it on yourself. This is a definite DIY situation, probably one of the simplest because you control what goes in your mouth. And you can discover for yourself that eating less actually feels better and is better.